many have cancer in the U.S. today, no man knows. What causes this is one of the riddles men puzzle over in their laboratories through a lifetime. In the 1930s, a diagnosis of cancer was always grim. We had surgery, and surgeons were perfecting their technique, trying to take out more and more tumor. And then you had radiotherapy, but radiotherapy was very crude in the 1930s. And with cancers like leukemia that are disseminated in the blood, there was no cure. Because you couldn't give radiation to the whole body without killing the patient, and you couldn't obviously do surgery with the whole body involved. In a basement lab at Children's Hospital in Boston, a pathologist named Sidney Farber was trying something new. He was looking for a way to kill childhood leukemia with chemicals. Sidney Farber was not well loved in Boston. He was this autocratic, stern kind of person which tends to, to put people off. So nobody wanted to give him facilities to do what he wanted to do because they thought it was crazy. In 1946, a colleague of Farber's, a chemist named Yella Pragada Subarau, had shown that folic acid could cure a certain kind of anemia. Dr. Farber thought, well, maybe this could be effective in acute leukemia, since they were both blood disorders. He obtained some folic acid from Dr. Subarau and injected it into children with acute lymphoblastic leukemia, an always fatal disease. He was a pathologist. He was not trained to take care of people, let alone little people. So you can imagine the attitude toward what he was doing. The experiment backfired. The folates only stimulated the cancer cells. Well, that seems like a disaster, and today, of course, it would be a disaster. But, uh, of course, that gave him another idea. Naturally, he said, well, if folates increase the growth, why not try antifolates? This time, Farber got an antifolate, a drug called aminopterin, and gave it to 16 children with ALL. And much to his surprise this time, instead of stimulating the leukemia, it massively destroyed the leukemia. It was unprecedented that you could see a remission from giving a chemical to a patient. It was written up in the New England Journal of Medicine, where it stirred a small controversy, because the patients all relapsed. There are lots of papers written by a very famous hematologist who said, you shouldn't do this because, you know, you may think it's really a terrific thing, but you still, patients are all dying, and so it doesn't mean anything. But it meant something to people who were thinking, if we're going to make progress in cancer, we had to do something about these cells that are circulating around in the bloodstream. Tonight, we take you to a little fella named Jimmy. Jimmy is suffering from cancer. Cancer needed a poster child. Jimmy's move of his favorite team, the Boston Braves. Hi, Jimmy. My name is Bill Macy. In 1948, Farber helped launch the Jimmy Fund, which would raise millions for the cause. What do you know? Right there in your hospital. Dollars poured in and went to new cancer research centers and new cancer drugs, like methotrexate, a relative of aminopterin that was easier to produce. The drugs were all highly toxic, and they worked in a crude way, killing healthy cells along with the cancer cells. Sometimes patients died from the side effects. We didn't know how to use them. Uh, we didn't know which patient to use them in. In Memphis, Tennessee, at a newly opened children's research hospital, a team of clinicians were studying how to use chemotherapy drugs more effectively. The hospital was opened, and Dr. Pinkel and a few early colleagues got together and systematically thought about how can we develop a protocol that might address all the problems seen in the 50s and really try to produce curative therapy. They tried longer chemotherapy treatments in different combinations. They added cranial radiation. They gave the methotrexate directly into the spinal column. And within 10 years, they were curing half of all cases of ALL. It was progress, but what about the other half? What was different about these children and their cancers? In the 1970s, scientists would find out as they began to unlock the mystery of the cancer cells. When we had deciphered these groups called T-cell leukemia, B-cell leukemia, or B-progenitor cell leukemia, they were entirely different diseases. We'd been grouping them and treating them all the same. They didn't respond all the same. The field of cancer genetics would continue to evolve over the next 30 years. 
revealing hundreds of variations in almost every kind of cancer. Two boys in Phoenix, Arizona, illustrate the importance of these variations. Adam O'Connor was diagnosed with a leukemia called pre-B-cell ALL when he was four years old. He was treated with the standard methotrexate-based regimen. It worked. I've been cancer-free for 11 years. I do triathlons. It's just an amazing thing that I could beat a disease like that and feel completely normal. So did your Christmas presents come yet? Haziel Olmeda has the same pre-B-cell ALL and got the same methotrexate-based regimen. But after three years, mm -hmm. his cancer came back. Cancer genetics revealed why. When we looked back at Haziel's leukemia to try to sort out why was it his leukemia that came back so fast and so widespread, it was determined that he had a chromosome abnormality that actually now is considered a very poor prognostic factor. ALL, like most cancers, is the result of several chromosomal abnormalities. An adult cancer called CML, for chronic myeloid leukemia, has just one abnormality, the Philadelphia chromosome. The abnormality was due to a translocation from two genes. One piece of the chromosome broke off, went to another one, and when the two joined, they made a new gene. And it's that gene that's driving the cell division. You know, it's just saying, go, 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 until the patient dies of leukemia. Every single patient has the same oncogenic abnormality, the Philadelphia chromosome, and most other cancers are far more heterogeneous. At his research lab in Portland, Oregon, Dr. Brian Drucker was working on a way to target just this one mutation. If cancer is sort of like a light bulb being stuck on, chemotherapy was, let's just take a baseball bat and knock out the light. And I looked at that and said, we've got to figure out why that light bulb stuck on. And if we can figure out why it's stuck on, then we can shut it down and we'll leave everything else intact. This is what we used to dream of when, when I started in the field, that you could actually have this kind of specificity. A lot of people said, well, we tried that, we've thought about it, it's never gonna work. Just get a bigger baseball bat. In 1995, Judy Oram learned that she had CML and was told that she had three to five years to live. She was given the standard therapy, a drug called interferon. The interferon really didn't do much for me. I was on it for three years. The best I got was down to 60% Philadelphia chromosome, which was not very good. Figuring out which the false positive. Dr. Drucker was testing a class of drugs that would target just the Philadelphia chromosome. He tried one called imatinib, also known as Gleevec. We'd get patients to donate some of their leukemia cells and we set them up in some assays with the drug, and we actually found that their leukemia cells didn't grow out in our cultures, but their normal cells did. And so it was absolutely clear that we were killing leukemia cells and not harming normal cells in cell lines, animals, and in patient samples. And that gave me great confidence that we needed to move this drug into people and see if it would work. I have a friend who called me and said, Judy, they announced on the radio, and it was in the newspaper, that the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society had given Dr. Drucker a translational grant to take a study from, you know, the Petri dish to get ready for human trials on CML. And I think you should get your name in there. She did. And when the first clinical trial began in 1998, she was on it as patient number nine. I started feeling better. I got my appetite back, my sense of smell. I put on weight. Within three months, the imatinib had nearly eradicated her CML with no side effects. They were able to actually get rid of the Philadelphia chromosome. When the interferon, I got down to 60% Philadelphia chromosome. On this, I got down to 5%. Judy was one of the people that I remember and always refer to when people say, when did you know your drug worked? Word spread quickly in the CML community. Patients began to band together and realize that it was a rare disease. They could actually help one another navigate through the channels, get their doctors to refer them, get themselves referred, and share information about the disease when nobody had information before. People were soon lining up for the phase two trial with this miracle drug, but there was a problem. 
Novartis said, we're not sure the drug is going to make enough money for us. If it's going to really hit enough people, we might stop. Well, all of us who are doing well are just panicked. Patients caught wind of that and started to lobby the drug company for access to clinical trials. They're kind of in a spot of, do we stop something that's working for people? And the drug company realized they needed to ramp up production. They needed to get into phase two quickly. Finally, the phase two trial went forward with great success. Results were reported in the New England Journal of Medicine in April 2001. It was one of the paradigm-changing publications because it is the first proof of principle of targeted therapy. Just one month later, imatinib was approved for human use by the FDA. For this one cancer, at least, it was the holy grail that scientists had been looking for since the days of Sidney Farber. Any problems, any symptoms, any... The last results you probably saw. Yeah, no, everything looks perfectly stable. There's absolutely no question that the work I did was built on the shoulders of giants. 50 years after Sidney Farber's work, we have a huge understanding of the genetic basis of cancer, and even some of the true biochemical and metabolic differences between a cancer cell and a normal cell, and all those are becoming amenable to targeting. It's a promising time to be an oncologist. So you're gonna get a spinal tap and then you'll get your chemo for five days? There has been incredible progress over the last four decades. 40 years ago, it was a death sentence. Barely any children would survive their acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Now, we are curing leukemia with a cure rate of almost 95%. Haziel's case is a tough one. While some children with ALL have the Philadelphia chromosome, now a druggable target, he has an abnormality which has not yet been targeted. And so his doctor relies on larger doses of standard chemotherapy. He just runs over 24 hours in a big yellow bag. When Haziel relapsed, we knew that it was an aggressive type of leukemia. And so at that point, we decided that in order to give him his best chance of cure, we would perform a bone marrow transplant. So we will use his 10-year-old brother as his matched donor sibling. So we're hoping that these donor cells are going to work and cure his leukemia, right? Yeah. I think they will. I have a good feeling I about it. I do too, because he was every, he had the same numbers on everything. I forget Ian's <laughs> As advances in research and therapy continue, the hope is that all cancers will one day become, if not curable, then chronic and manageable diseases. Now we have lots of patients who have been treated and are cured. And I think as we go in the future, you're going to see more and more patients followed by the primary care physician. And I think it's a good thing. Bye. Bye, sweetie.